So, this one's gonna be about Seth Gordon once again. It's so basically the exact same video that we're gonna watch and that we're gonna think about then. And it is gonna be about marketing, storytelling, attention, and the future of work, apparently. And this is a video by the Nordic Business Forum. So the link is probably gonna be down in the description. If you wanna check it out, check it out. And this time it is actually like synchronized. It is nice and it is fluent. It is not like just choppy and laggy and shit. Well, yeah, more after the intro. Please check out the description, or that description actually, because there's a lot of free things that you can get. First of all, there is the link to the podcast because this is actually a podcast and a YouTube quote unquote show. On the other hand, you're also going to get three things, as I said, for example, the free PDFs of the things that I've highlighted in this episode or in other episodes, if I've highlighted something, then it is going to be in a tiny PDF. You can download it and print it and share it and do whatever with it. And there is everything in this that I've gone through in this episode, which is pretty amazing because some people like to listen, therefore we're having a podcast. Some people like to watch, therefore we're having the YouTube videos. And some other people like to read things. And this is why there is also the free PDF. And there is as well some music. So if you do want to have some background music in this video, then please also check out the third link. Or it's actually, I think, the fourth link, but third section, something like that. And there's also just different tracks to choose from. And they're all, I think, an hour long. So, so you should be fine. Everything should be fine. Should be good to go. And yeah, enjoy the episode. And I'm going to see you. And yeah. With that being said, hello and welcome back to the next episode of the Self Development with Tactics podcast. And I really am happy to be here. And I really am happy to go through this video maybe even the rest of the video we're gonna see we're gonna notice it's just 10 minutes left so yeah we're probably gonna go through it i guess and i hope that there's gonna be more i hope that there's gonna be even more good things but um yeah so as you can see here you can even see the cursor and everything is fluent and everything is nice and it should also be a little tiny bit louder since the last time it's been like a little bit too silent but i think we have to go back a little tiny bit a little tiny bit I think to this one question mark. Yeah, this is where we have actually stopped yesterday. So what story do you regret having believed in? We're going to see. Well, um, I'm pretty good at not carrying regrets around too much because they just don't really work very well. But I'll give you a, a couple of business examples. Uh, in 1993, the story was online services would only work if they made money. And I, at the time, was working with CompuServe, AOL, and Prodigy. And this thing came along called the World Wide Web. And I believed the story that we were in this static, controlled world, and if it didn't make money, it wasn't real. So I ignored the World Wide Web for a year and a half. I didn't sign up for all the domains I could have. I mean, I was halfway done doing it. I didn't build the website I should have built. I didn't engage in 17 other behaviors because the story, my worldview was, we were done. It was AOL, CompuServe, and Prodigy. No one else was welcome. And the World Wide Web, which made no money, which was slower, clunkier, and filled with junk, never going to mount to anything. Now, did other people see what was happening differently than I did? Of course they did, right? Jerry and David built Yahoo on the basis of them seeing what I saw and interpreting the, exactly the same data totally differently. Yeah, and I think it is quite also important to maybe translate that into what is going on right now. Maybe TikTok, maybe not ignoring TikTok because it might be anything we have seen it. It is uh, definitely growing, you know, and there's definitely a lot of users that are using it and definitely a lot of people that do want to see more, I think, as well. Because, I mean, like, I have seen people like soccer players right now just also going on to TikTok and also other celebrities just basically people that have been really quite big on Instagram as well since uh, they're athletes and they are just known and whatnot. And which then led me think like, or led me to thinking, well, there must be something about it, I guess. And I do think that it is going to grow. Like the more people are going to hop on there, the more people are also going to view stuff. They are the, the better, basically. And the more people are also going to come and the more people are also going to come to create something. And this is definitely also something that I should be thinking about more because I am not producing a lot of content for TikTok at this point of time, mostly because I can't schedule it. 
<laughs> as funny as it might sound, but normally I'm using just something, uh, some schedule stuff um, so that I can plan everything beforehand and in, in advance and that everything is going to be fine for a day, for two days, for three days, for whatnot, which makes it way, way fucking more easier for me. But it's not available at this point of time. I think this is something you can restrict through the API that uh, you're having. At this point of time, you can post from your PC. I've seen a framework from um, TikTok themselves, actually. They have uh, basically, I think it's published, published an API and or basically also source code. I don't really know what it is. I just know that it's called like that. Um, well, yeah, well, let's move ahead. The next question is, how important book, how important book was Tribes for you personally? Funny question. Quite. I guess the way I interpret it is I cried when I wrote Tribes. And I didn't cry when I wrote Permission Marketing. That uh, Tribes is the first book where I got at the heart of the change I am seeking to make in the world. Uh, it doesn't matter to me if Avon or Harley Davidson sells yet another product. It matters to me that human beings step up, that they speak their truth, that they look other people in the eye, that they shake off this industrialized regime and instead choose to take advantage of this moment that we have. And I don't know how long we'll have it. All of us are more powerful than we think we are. All of us have the ability to make things better. And that's why I wrote Tribes. And I think this is just in something incredibly important to, to underline that we all can do something and we, have, we all can talk about something and we all have something to talk about. I do believe that there is going to be a lot of people that say like, well, no, uh, I do not want to have a podcast. I do not want to have a blog because there is not something that I can talk about, think about, do something about. But we all have something. We all have something that we have recognized you know we all recognize some things um some people recognize more for example seth gordon he's just she, uh, she he figured out so many things and he also saw so many patterns interesting patterns and patterns that led him to talking about some things on a podcast as a blog post whatever in a book and the bottom line is that we all can talk about something and we all have something to talk about, but not a lot of people are just using the advantage of the internet, which is definitely an advantage. Um, if you just look back a few years, a few, well, not even a few hundred years, but a hundred years, there was no internet, as far as I know, at least. Um, but, and it is a, a massive advantage that we all are having. You know, the connection, we can connect to actually everyone. And we can put out something that is seen by everyone. The cost of actually getting into the game uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago was massive. Like just, I don't know, having uh, an article in a newspaper. You had to be, first of all, a journalist either or had to have like quite some money to just put it as an ad or just have it as an ad. So it really got relatively simple. It is still not easy. This is the problem. It is just one of these things that is simple but not easy, you know. But something that Seth also says is like, if you do not want to publish it under your name, you can also just use some other people's name, you know. You can use another name and just publish whatever you're willing to publish until you're really happy with it and then you can publish it under your name. If it is like, okay, I'm not proud of it, what I'm doing. I'm not just really sure if it is the right thing that I'm doing, but you can do something and you can use a pseudonym and whatnot, so that you're going to be quote-unquote safe if you want to. But yeah, the next question is, how to better understand and handle the linchpins? Linchpins, by the way, is just a book that he has written, and it is basically, I could actually, linchpin, let's see what Google is actually saying. The social internet linchpin, internet, uh, a person or thing vital to an enterprise or organization. Yes. A pin passed through the end of axle to keep a wheel in position. Yes, and if the wheel is not in position, then everything is going to be fucked. Quite. And this is also what this person is. It is essential for the company. And I think, and I assume, therefore, in the book he's talking about how to be a linchpin and how to be a person that the company and or maybe even people, if you think about being a leader, can't live without with, basically. And what do you have to do then? You know, what qualities do you have to have what things have do you do you have to offer for the people for the company for whomever to be such a person 
but let's see what he's thinking and talking and saying and what. The idea of linchpin is that when we walk away from the fact that factory A is better than factory B and that the way you're going to win is by having a more efficient factory. And we have to walk away from that because someone has more robots than you and someone is willing to be cheaper than you. Then what do you have, right? Well, what you have is people. And the question is, do you have compliant people? People who do what they're told, show up on time, get more efficient each day. Well, that's not gonna help you very much because that's what you need in an efficient factory. Or do you have caring people, passionate people, connected people? Do you have people who act like they own the place? Do you have people who can look a customer in the eye and make a difference for that customer? Because it seems to me that's all you got left. Because once it's a robot, anyone can buy the robot. But that person, that person works with you, not for you, but with you. And no one else can have them as long as the two of you are dancing together. That's where success lies. So you don't handle linchpins. You welcome them, you embrace them, you nurture them. That the organization of the future doesn't need a lot of people. I run the Alt MBA, the school I run, with two full-time people. What you need are people who are willing to make a difference, who are willing to stand up and say, I made this, who are restless enough that if you don't keep it great, they'll leave because someone else wants them. That's the opposite of what most companies want. Most companies say, I want people to be downtrodden, I want them to be compliant, and I don't want to worry about them leaving. Well, isn't it better to have someone so great you would miss them if they were gone than it is to have mediocre people who you're confident have no place better to go? I think that this is the frontier we have to go forward. And if you're a worker, you have to make a new commitment, which is you've been brainwashed for so many years, you've been tricked, you've been hoodwinked, and you've been put into debt by complying. And if you're just going to comply more, you're going to get more of that. And there's an alternative. And the alternative, because everyone has a laptop, and that laptop is connected to 1.5 billion other people, you have the same tool as everybody else. How are you going to use it? And this is also something that he really often uh, talks about in a little bit of a different context, in the context of school, actually. In the context of, content of, context, I'm sorry, context of school, basically because uh, compliance. You know, I'm going to sit there, I'm going to stand up when the teacher comes into the door or through the door or however and whatnot. Um, and if, I don't know, something happens, I'm going to be compliant. I'm not going to raise my voice in a bad way or in a, if I wasn't asked to do so. And I'm not going to shout just uh, the answer and, and whatnot. Like just compliance. I think it just summarizes everything quite uh, easily there. And he often says, and he often talks about like the whole origin, you know, why we are in school and why school is so compliant and why we have to be compliant in school. And the whole reason is that school basically was made for the industrialists. The industrialists willing to have some workers, workers for the assembly line, workers for some other jobs that do not really need a lot of brain power necessarily, but a lot of compliance, you know. Because you have to stay in line, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to just uh, do this for X amount of hours a day and not something else. And you should be doing it in this way and not in a different way and whatnot. And I don't know, like I think we clearly see like the parallels to school and also just um, or the parallels between what he's talking about, what I'm talking about and what school is all about and what companies sometimes are. No, not necessarily, and this is something I think that that is quite nice to see that at least this is how I am seeing it, kind of. You know, maybe this is just what I've seen up to this point and I haven't seen too much, so I might also be wrong there, that more companies are willing to have people that are doing something extraordinarily and that are doing things not necessarily in the way they, quote-unquote, are supposed to be doing it or are supposed to be doing, but rather in a way that is just good, I guess. And, and I do also really want to embrace that. I do really just believe in that because for me, and this is something that I have, I think, also talk about like pretty, pretty often, for me, it doesn't necessarily make any sense or it does really not make any fucking sense to do things in a way that are not working for me or that isn't working for me. Like, 
for me, it makes sense. And I think it, for, for everyone, it makes sense to do things in a way that works for this particular person. Not just in a way that the teacher said I should be doing it, not the way that my just boss said I should be doing it. If it is not working for me, like, why should I be doing it in this way? And all the other things, like all the other things that boil down to us just being different, just because we all are individuals and we all are different from each and another. And this is amazing. You know, for people that want to have compliance, maybe not so. Because, well, yeah, okay, it depends. Because there's still going to be quite some people that are compliant and they're going to do whatever you're saying and stuff. Huge companies with, with relatively small workforce, blessing or a curse? You know, it's a curse and a blessing that work as we know it, which only started 150 years ago, is now going away. That there was a 150-year parenthesis like, just like the Gutenberg parenthesis, which lasted 500 years. I right? printed books, I love them, not gonna be around much longer as a tool of change. And that job, will you go to a building and you stay there 40 hours and then you go home and then you do that again for 40 years and then you retire, that's gone, it's gone. We wish it would come back, some people do. We want to elect people who promise they will bring it back, it's not gonna happen. So, given that that's the case, we need to find meaningful work even if that work doesn't involve helping a company make a profit. That this is the richest planet the planet has ever seen. That there are more people who are overweight now on the planet as a percentage than ever in history. There are more people who have what they need to survive as a percentage than ever in history. And it's the safest the world has ever been. Now what are we going to do? What we better do is figure out how to make it also meaningful. What we better figure out how to do is take these abundant resources and distribute them ever better because the inequality, the inequity between people who are lucky enough to show up in a monopoly on the right day and the right time and those who aren't, if that gets worse, it's going to be a lot harder to build a culture we're proud of. And I think this is also quite interesting to see and also quite interesting to, to think about that it is definitely the case that at this point in time, it's the best it has ever been. We have more money, people are richer in general, people are uh, better off in terms of also in poorer countries, they're having more food and whatnot. Um, also probably more help by the richer countries and stuff. Then there's uh, not too many diseases, at least most often. This point of time, yeah, difficult. But overall, we really have to be grateful for what things are like and how it just how the world and how life is at this point of time and and I think that this difficult time that we're having right now it is is also a good way to just show us that it is not always it hasn't always been the case and it maybe is not always gonna be the case. These people that are like I would say 50 right now, they're really fortunate because after war they well okay actually there has been like 2008 the whole crash and something so this has not been such a cool thing but there's a lot of time or there's a long time between the last thing that's really been fucked which is the the second world war and just what is happening right now these people are really fortunate because they've lived the the majority of their life in freedom in peace with enough money with enough resources with possibilities and all these things that are not something that we can expect and not something that is like we should just be grateful for that you know we should really really indeed be grateful for whatever we're having family friends money food everything and i think this is just really important you know because i think this is something that tony robbins said but but i'm not quite sure actually when we are grateful, there is nothing else that we can feel. If you feel grateful, you're feeling grateful. Nothing else. Doesn't work. It's not possible. So yeah, practice gratefulness, I would say. And this might um, be the question of today, actually. Do you practice gratefulness? And why don't you? I don't know. Maybe there is a reason. Maybe you haven't thought about it. Maybe something else. I don't know. But, but think about it. Maybe it's going to be in terms of a journal. Maybe it's going to be in terms of something else. Maybe it's going to be in terms of 
you thinking about something. You know, for example, Gary Vee often visualizes some of his really close, uh, I think also friends, but I'm not quite sure, but definitely family members dying, which is just a way to, to see how it is really like when it is indeed the case. And it is not the case, fortunately, and I'm also fortunate that it is not the case for me, and I hope that it is also not the case for you, that you are in pain right now. But um, visualizing that and seeing that it could also be different just puts you into a spot where you see how things could actually be as well. And I think this could also just make you, or will also make you grateful. If it is not the case, of course, quite. Yeah. Let's see. What have we misunderstood about, misunderstood about talent? There's a difference between skill and talent. Skill is something you learn. Talent is something you're born with. I will grant you that dunking a basketball is a talent. I will never be able to dunk a basketball. But with few exceptions, almost everything in our life is a skill. Showing up on time is a skill. Learning how to read is a skill. Being persuasive is a skill. Being brave enough to speak up and speak the truth is a skill. Caring about customers is a skill. Heart surgery is a skill. So the lie of talent is letting yourself off the hook by saying, well, I wasn't born able to do that. Because you're not going to get in the MBA. I'm not going to get in the MBA. So let's leave that off the table. For everything else, it's about skill. And skill is easier to acquire now than ever before. Explain the resistance is a symptom that you are on the right track. My friend Steve Pressfield coined this term, the resistance. Resistance, he doesn't put the word the in front of it. Resistance is what gives us writer's block, which is a made up disease. Resistance is what makes us hesitate, change our clothes six times before we go on a blind date, be nervous before we give a speech. It's our amygdala, it's the voice in the back of our head saying, don't do that, you're in trouble. Well, you were in trouble when that alarm went off and there was a saber-toothed tiger or a mastodon around. You were in trouble if that alarm went off and the chief was about to throw you out of the village. But now, when that alarm goes off, it's a light telling you you're going in the right direction. Because that's what it means to be remarkable, to be a linchpin, to stand out, is you're nervous. You're afraid because something might not work. And if we use it as a compass, we can't fight it, but we can dance with it. If we use it as a compass, it almost always points in exactly the direction we ought to be going. I do actually do not want to stop it. Um, really important, the lizard brain. Look it up. It is basically what he's talking about, like the amygdala, uh, resistance, um, press field. Basically like the lizard brain as... Um, as being feared and letting fear dictate our lives look it up i think it is better um it's a pretty interesting concept it's a pretty interesting thought and it's something that's in general relatively interesting uh also writer's block there is nothing like writer's block but we're just concerned about writing something that's not good and i think it is also the case for creative people like i'm a designer actually i'm attending a graphic design school um sometimes i feel like well i can't come up with a good idea But it's not like I can't come up with an idea. And sometimes we just need to have really, really, really a lot of bad ideas until we can get to some sort of a good idea. So, yeah, you know, there is nothing such or there is not such a thing like writer's block. Let's go back. Interesting phenomena right now. And it always takes a little bit of time. I'm spending a lot of time thinking about how deeply the fork in the river is getting uh, dug into the ground. And on this side are the connected people who go ever deeper, doing the research, looking at what works, testing, measuring, figuring out what's going to pay off for our culture. And on this side are emotion-driven, knee-jerk, fear-based reactions of pick your own truth. And the problem with pick your own truth is that it leads to conspiracy theories, which lead to ever more pick your own truth. And sooner or later, you're just living in Gaga land, where there's no real connection to the things you believe and do and what actually works. And I saw this behavior from big time marketers in 1995 who insisted the world would be one way or another. I see it often when uh, you talk to boards of directors or people who have something that's succeeding or was and isn't going to succeed anymore. 
But now you also see it with the public. You see it with people, I just heard this the other day, many low-income people, when they seek out a loan, seek out a high-interest loan, because it's a big number. Big numbers must be good. And you just want to go, oh my goodness. Because you know that's silly, I know that's silly, but if you're surrounded by a culture that doesn't teach you, that doesn't have expectations that you're going to be able to dig deeper, Fucked then up. you're going to suffer. And I think we have to figure out how to bridge these gaps early and often to help people realize that the things we take for granted, that we can be warm and out of the weather and have enough to eat and all these other things, they came from a philosophy of test and measure, a philosophy of paying it forward and building a culture. And I'm, I feel ever more urgency that we need to do that now. And that's it. This and I'm actually really happy because I've also thought about ending it like in the middle of it, but it would have been uh, it would have it would have not been a good thing. But something that I've seen in the background, and I'm gonna show you really quickly. Um, here is Lynch pin the book, yeah, there it is. And by the way, like his glasses, and also like him being really humble since uh, he's actually a multi millionaire, as far as I remember, with a net worth of 50 million or something, so he's definitely having quite a lot of money. But uh, yeah, humble, humble as fuck, and such an interesting person. Uh, please check out Akimbo, A K I M B O. Uh, that link is uh, his podcast. Also, Seth.blog is his blog. Uh, there's no YouTube channel, but there's an Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook account. Everything really, really, really incredibly interesting. And I think it is just worth checking it out. And yeah, I think that is going to be it for this episode i really hope that you've learned something and i really also think that there's quite a lot of good stuff in that and i guess that i might just have more videos to go through because there's several things that i like to 